Hi, I'm Kevin Kirby coming to you from our house here in Sacramento, California. I have with me Chris Cox, who's been visiting, visiting us for a week here in uh, Sacramento. Uh, Chris is a teaching fellow at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland, and he's been spending time in my office, and I thought it'd be fun for us to talk about some questions that he had. He's had some very good questions about uh, biomechanics and orthotics here the last few weeks, so I asked him to do a little interview. So we're going to get going here with Chris going ahead. Okay. Kevin, my first question is, does the range of motion determine the axis, or does the axis determine the range of motion? So any sort of joint axis is going to be determined by the range of motion that occurs. The uh, the subtalar joint axis, for example, is not a, a strict hinge-like mechanism, but it does have a, a movement that is going to be around a close around an axis, but it moves over time. So the range of motion or the, the motion is what determines the axis of the subtalar joint or the mid-tarsal joint and not a, uh, like a fixed hinge inside the foot. Okay. Great. My second question is, in the United Kingdom, during the patient assessment, if the clinician feels there is a, a high pronation moment acting on the foot, some clinicians may prescribe a medial rear foot wedge or a various wedge or a Kirby Skive modification in order to um, reduce that pronation moment. As the center of pressure moves forward on the foot, do you feel that these design features will be altering the subtalar joint pronation moment or do you feel it will be reducing the total foot pronation moment? Yeah, that's a good question. In, in early stance, um, when we have the corrections that shift the center pressure medially, such as the medial heel skive um, technique where we put a varus wedge on the heel, the early mid stance phase is when the majority of the, um, of the supination moments are coming from the orthotic to control the excessive pronation moments. However, as we've talked before, is that the in late mid stance, the medial heel sky isn't as effective because now the center pressure has moved forward on the foot. And as it moves forward, if you put too much supination force on the foot, you can actually cause excessive pronation motion of the foot uh, if you put too much supination on the foot early in the stance. So the answer to that would be, as we go from early stance to late stance, the medial heel sky type modification will be less effective and you'll have to rely on other features or the orthosis in order to reduce the pronation moments on the foot. Okay. My next question is um, about what I was taught when I was at university. One of the things that we were taught was the foot got its stability by locking of the mid-tarsal joint. We now know that not to be the case. What do you believe are the key features that allow the foot to get its stability? Well, you know, in regards to the mid-tarsal joint and mid-foot joints, this is a real important question because uh, in the past we've always said, well, the mid-tarsal joint locks or we have a locking mechanism of the mid-tarsal joint. In, in actual fact, the mid-tarsal joint doesn't uh, truly lock because it's a spring-like mechanism. It's, I use the analogy of a a set of leaf springs in the rear axle of a truck where under small loads it deforms small amount and under larger loads it deforms more and this, the human foot is very similar uh, when we load the foot with five pounds of force it may deform uh, some if we load it with 15 pounds of force it may deform a little more but if we load it with 150 pounds of force it may deform even more that being said there is going to be stability in the foot and that's under the dorsiflexion loads we get from the, four, uh, the ground reaction force acting on the forefoot. And those, st those stabilizing factors are going to be number one dependent on this, this load sharing system we have within the foot, which is, consists of the plantar fascia most superficially, the plantar intrinsic muscles just uh, deep to the plantar fascia, the deep flexors, including the posterior tibial flexor digitorum longus and uh, flexor hallucis longus muscles and also the perineus longus and then the deepest layers are going to be the passive ligaments of the plantar arch uh, that are going to be the plantar ligaments. 
So those four tension bearing structures are going to be either under passive load, including the plantar fascia and the plantar ligaments, or they're going to be under uh, active uh, control of the central nervous system uh, by way of activation of the deep flexors and perineus longus and or the plantar intrinsics in order to produce tension forces that resist the deformation of the arch. So in answer to the question, the mid-tarsal joint does not lock, uh, the midfoot joints don't lock, but they do resist deformation and in so doing we have a spring-like mechanism in the arch of the human foot that helps us to walk over uneven surfaces, to respond to variations in terrain, to do side-to-side -side motions, and to allow the foot to be not only flexible at times when it needs to be flexible, but also to be rigid at times when it needs to push off the foot and produce efficiency of uh, locomotion. Another concept we were taught was the foot would resupinate so that it would become a much more rigid lever as you went into propulsion. Now during propulsion, um, the forefoot, the external forefoot <clears throat> dorsiflexion moment is fairly large. Do you believe that we get our stability by generating internal plantar flexion moments or do you believe that it's still about um, resupinating so that the foot becomes much more stiffer? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, a good question also because the, um, I, I think that you know, Chris here is getting into some of the more advanced concepts that we're trying to introduce uh, into podiatry and the foot health professions and that the um, uh, stability we get is not just caused by the supination of the subtotal joint. Now that supination of the joint does is a stabilizing factor in that what it does, it takes the tatus and calcaneus at the mid-tarsal joint, so we have a tatal navicular joint and calcaneal cuboid joint. As we supinate the foot and they stack more one on top of another, we create a more rigid beam for the uh, midfoot and subtil uh, the I'm sorry the midtarsal joint midtarsal joints to be more rigid under deformation loads such as the ground reaction force pushing up on the forefoot and tending to cause an external forefoot dorsal flexion moment. But as Chris mentioned, that it's one of the issues we also we have in the human foot a a passive mechanism by which when we go from latent stance to propulsion we have the windlass effect and that windlass effect of the tension, increased tension in the plantar fascia by the hallux dorsiflexion tends to assist supination but also makes the foot more rigid so that during propulsion when we have those high dorsiflexion loads on the forefoot the plantar fascia tensioning up, the plantar, uh, plantar intrinsic firing and also the um, uh, deep flexors and perineus longus possibly firing early propulsion especially is going to stiffen the foot to resist those dorsiflexion moments that would tend to flatten the arch of the foot. So in answer to the question, it's not just subtelligent supination that causes the ability of the foot to pro propel, it's a lot of it's the just the inherent uh, load sharing system of the arch of the foot where you have both passive and active structures working together to stabilize the foot when it needs to be stable both by uh, metabolically um, mechanisms that save metabolic energy, such as the passive ligaments, the passive elements, plantar fascia and plantar ligaments, but also the active elements, which would be the plantar intrinsics and the deep flexors and perineus longus, all working together to prevent the arch from deforming uh, with high dorsiflexion loads on the forefoot. Okay, the last question would be about the patient assessment process. What do you believe are the, the most important assessment um, and techniques that you can use to help clinical decision making? Yeah, I, I think that it's, uh, that's a complex question because we have many tools available to us uh, by which to assess patients. We can use uh, clinical examination, obviously just taking a good patient history is important to know you know, where is the pain, when does it occur, how long has it been around, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Um, the clinical assessment tools though in the physical examination I would use, I would be looking at you know, the shape of the foot. I'm obviously trying to determine exactly anatomically which structure is injured. And if, it was a, if the 
patient says, well, I have medial ankle pain, I want to know, is it the deltoid ligament, is it the posterior tibial tendon, is it possibly the uh, posterior tibial neurovascular bundle, could it possibly be um, something in the medial calcaneus, and they said it's the medial heel, uh, or could it be a bone bruise of the medial malleolus. So there's obviously other causes, but you have to know your anatomy in order to make those diagnoses uh, properly, because the the anatomical structure that is injured is going to direct your treatment. Um, if it's a posterior tibial tendonitis, obviously we want to, since the posterior tibial muscle is a supinator of the subtalar joint, we want to try to get them into some sort of shoe and or orthotic combination that's going to put more supination into the foot so the posterior tibial doesn't have to contract so hard to supinate the foot. Uh, if we have a plantar fascial tendonitis, we want to have a shoe and orthotic or a strapping combination that's going to do the same function as the uh, plantar fascia which is to prevent collapse of the arch. So that may be a low die strapping, that could be a over-the-counter or custom orthosis, that could be stretching out their calf muscles to decrease the tension force in the Achilles tendon, maybe putting them in, into different types of shoes. So uh, these are all uh, things that I, I'm thinking about when I'm examining a patient to thinking about not only where is the anatomical structure, what is the mechanism of injury, uh, and then using other clinical tools such as uh, doing a supination resistance test or a maximum pronation test. Uh, watching them walk is very important so you can see the function of the central nervous system uh, during gait uh, to make sure that there's no central nervous system defects that could be causing uh, these symptoms to occur. Inspecting shoes, talking to them about their, if they're runners, talking about their training program and what type of training they're doing, etc. Thank you, Kevin. All right, no more questions? No That's more questions. Good. All right, very good. Well, thanks for the, oh, here's, and Gracie has to get into the uh, picture here. Uh, say hi, Gracie. Gracie.